there were there had to be stories to be told there, and I was I was just I was just drawn to it, and I was I was wondering why nobody why it's never been shown on film and TV. So Chris and I, um, sort of being uh, sort of being we're, we're cisgender uh, white straight men. Uh, we uh, we knew that the only way about to go about doing this was just to really. Uh, really apply the same research process that we did to one of my previous films called uh, Prince of Broadway, which is really spending a lot of time in the area and, and finding a collaborator. And, uh, you know, Prince of Broadway took about a, a year and this one took about eight months um, where we, we just pounded the pavement and introduced ourselves to people and we were looking for something. We didn't really have any idea. Uh, we didn't know what, we didn't want to impose a script or a, uh, any sort of plot. So we, we, we eventually found Maya Taylor. Um, Maya Taylor was actually uh, hanging out with some friends at the LGBT center, which is about a block away from this intersection. And I went up to her in one of those moments where it just she was our passport. You know, we, we we introduced ourselves. We and she expressed this wonderful enthusiasm. She was an aspiring, she is an aspiring actress, and now a full fledged actress. And uh, well, right off the bat, she was like, "I want to work with you." And we exchanged contact information. It went from there, and we started hanging out regularly. Doing, hearing all of the stories that she had, anecdotes, etc. And then it was one day, I'll shut up soon, sorry, I know it's wrong with it. But um, it was one day that she brought Kiki to the table. We were hanging out at the local Jack in the Box restaurant, uh, if you can call it a restaurant. And uh, she sat down across the table from us next to Maya, Kiki did. And the second I saw the two of them together, I thought, dynamic duo right there. They, they complemented each other, they contrasted each other, they were finishing each other's sentences, they were setting up jokes, delivering punchlines, and I just thought, we're gonna have to write two characters for these two women to play. And it was just, it went from there. And I know that collaboration you mentioned is very important to you, so could you talk a little bit about once you were at that point and going forward, what that collaboration looked like with the script and, and sure. also the um, Well, at that point, when I knew it was gonna be about basically Chris and I were, we wanted to apply some sort of universal theme, right? Something that anybody, anywhere in the world can identify with. And once we saw the two together and knew we were going to be writing for them, we thought, this is a, a film about friendship, right? So then I, uh, I, I at that point, I, I told the girls, I was like, I have three ideas, and they're very simple. They're not even fleshed out. One, it has to take place on one night because of our budget. We, we, we you know, wardrobe changes cost money, so it needs to take place in a 24-hour period. Number two, I think it's about one person finding another person or two people coming together. And number three, uh, it, oh, I want everybody to converge at the end at donut time. I want this climactic Mike Lee-ish scene, very Mike Lee influenced. And so I, um, I then, uh, we started throwing around ideas, and Kiki, about two weeks later, said to me, uh, I have an idea for you, I, I, there's a story that happened. It never really even played itself out to fruition in real life, but it was something that was being contemplated by one of the, the girls in the neighborhood when she found out that her boyfriend was cheating on her with a quote-unquote fish, and we said, excuse me, can you define that? <laughs> and, uh, and, and Chris and I just immediately thought, okay, that's our A plot. It's extremely dynamic. I mean, it, 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 it takes the characters on a journey, it's layered. Um, and so really it was from there that we started doing these script mints, which was half a script, half a treatment, workshop sessions, etc. And just involving the girls all along, you know, throughout the whole entire process. And uh, all the way through post-production, actually. And in addition to these first-time actors, you have a couple um, up here tonight who have uh, you've worked with several times before. So uh, James and Karen, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what it's like collaborating with a director across multiple projects. Well, this is my fifth film with Sean, we go way back. And uh, normally, uh, when when he has a project, he calls me up. He says, "I have this project. How do we uh, work you into it?" So this time, he said, "You know, if it's an LA movie, then uh, all the cab drivers in LA are Armenians. So well, what about that cab driver?" So then it went to uh, Rosemary having his whole family. Yeah, so in previous times he would, he just, yeah, you know, one film we, we did before this, he just called me up and said, hey, I have a project, uh, will you be able to play a, a porn producer? <laughs> I said, no. The next thing I knew, I was in LA playing uh, my role in Starlet, and with the one previous, he just showed up at my work, 
one day and he said, hey, I got some money together, I put a camera, let's go make Prince of Broadway. So that was our last three films. Um, Sean and I met at a 24-hour vet when my dog got hit by a car, this is true, on 17th Street. And he was like, I really liked you on the wire. And I was like, thanks, dude, my dog's almost dead, but... <laughs> yeah, his his book, he wasn't like Zee! in my face, and then I would be like, I don't fucking whip your ass in a vet's park. office, like no. yeah, which is like the dude's like, I've seen your dick, basically, is what was <laughs> by seeing Ken Park. Um, but then what happened was was uh, uh, we started seeing each other around, and I kind of understood the types of movies that Sean were making, which were you know like vocational movies, right? So that's the running thread that I see, is like, as a human being more than their job, right? And I was like, oh, that's really, that's interesting to me, not just as an actor, just as a person. So he's like, I'm making this movie about porn in the valley. And he told me at Crunch. I was like, all right, let's go do it. Like, let's just call me when you're ready. And so that ended up being a really fun experience for me. It was a lot more controlled than Tangerine, obviously, because we were shooting in a house. And so uh, for this, he originally wanted me to do it, and then he was like, well, it's really similar to the character in Starlet. And I was like, okay. And then he asked me for a friend of mine's number. Um, and so I was like, yeah. And then I put in a good word with him, and he's like, hey, your friend never called me back, so you're free two days in January. I was like, thanks. And so um, I showed up, and I and I did it. And then, but more in the spirit of your question about the, the collaborative effort is that what's really cool when I was thinking about this is like, this movie, in some ways, is the promise of what has been talked about the last couple of years with the democratization of creativity, right? So it's like, oh, fuck. It's finally, like, come to fruition. But along with that, and I think, like, what you can sort of feel, and I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky to be a part of it, is that um, it's, like, completely this weird socialist way that Sean is making movies, where it's like, what does everyone think? And it's like, well, I think, and then it ends up, which is fucking crazy, because that's actually not how most movies are made, and I think that that's why it feels so refreshing, and why if Sean would ask me to do anything, at this point, like, I'm, you know, we're gonna do another movie together, and I'm sure Karn will, I think for the, for the next one, it's like, oh, I'll just show up in pre-production, and then put my two cents in what I think should go on there, and it's actually like a really, um, I don't know, it's a really special process, and I think that uh, as Sean matures, and obviously, like, it becomes, like, it's so, he's becoming really confident, it's like, you can see that, it just, it comes out of the screen that, like, everybody is sort of equally involved, so, it's, I mean, it's pretty incredible, you know? And, um, going back to this idea that the film started with a place, um, obviously it has a very strong sense of place, and I'd be curious to hear about working in all of these places, maybe from Darren and Chang. And especially with the, you know, having it be set up on the streets and also um, with public transport in LA, which is something you never see really. So, Darren or Sean, teaching? We have our distributors of takeout over there. The show back daddy, yes. Mike Sergio, Cabu. Yeah, it's actually very similar to how, you know, like we work, when we, uh, Sean and I, Make takeout together. We found this uh, takeout little takeout uh, restaurant, and then we just went in there, and then got their trust, and we worked there when they never shut down the business. So we just work. You know, when there's no customer, we you know we go in there, shoot for like ten minutes, twenty minutes, and we come out when they're busy. So in donut time, it's exactly the same thing, and we only got two nights, and. We're like, okay, we have to really you know, work this. And at a, at the time, the owner is in the back making donuts. So I said, well, you know, Sean called me. I think that that's, we just decided, me as the donut, uh, the donut time owner, like the, the day off. So he said, okay, well, you're just going to be the manager and jump in there and you know, do this. So I said, okay, well, I kind of know how they doing business, right? Every day, day in, day out. So, that was really interesting, shooting at the working donut shop. And then sometimes I had to sell donuts to the real customer. That's true, like in the middle of a take, too. Yeah, I just have to work it in because we don't want to cut, we don't want to, you know, clean, we, we cannot bother the customer. 
so it's really interesting. And remember, she was also <laughs> continuity on the film. So that's and, uh, and costume, <laughs> and operating a camera, and acting in it. Yeah. And when we got to the streets, um, there was a level of intimacy, obviously, with the actors and the iPhone, and, and you know that afforded us a, a lot of you know, these really close, um, very intimate uh, shots. Um, on the street, you know, there was a compact, you know, element to it that enabled us to move very quickly and, and shoot on, you know, city buses and things like that. And it was, we owned all of our locations, but it was just very, very easy to move around without disrupting people, without creating any, you know, element of like, ah, oh, where are these guys with these big cameras? You know, when you, you're working on a set where your heaviest piece of equipment is your boom, um, you know, there's something very kind of fleet of foot about it. So that, um, that was definitely a, a, a real, Fun part, you know, created a lot of the energy of the film, um, and, and again, the intimacy uh, came from that. I'm glad you did my segue for me, but um, I want to obviously talk about shooting on the iPhone. I was wondering if you could um, describe a bit what your setup was, maybe radium, you could radium. talk about it, and all the, favorite question. all the things that you did to, to turn that into what we saw on the screen tonight. James just sounds sound like he just cast himself in our next movie. <laughs> I did not. That is not true. Uh, had it been anybody else but Sean who called me and, 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 and asked me to shoot a movie on a couple of phones, I would have said, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I was tempted to, to do that, even with Sean. Um, it, it was, uh, uh, I mean, it's a little, little convincing. Um, but Sean had done a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of research while I was busy shooting another show in New York. He was in LA, uh, uh, being the, the unemployed director all the time to, to, uh, <laughs> to did all of the research on uh, on the film, and uh, and uh, he was able to find this this little little. Uh, well, first there's the app that lets you lock down quite a few important uh, perimeters, uh, and and he, and uh, and then he found these and one of lens that was made by Moondock Labs, which at the time wasn't shipped yet, it was just in crowdfunding phase, and, and uh, uh, Sean was able to convince them to, uh, to uh, lend us three of them. And what's interesting, they were, they were still kind of in prototype phase, so they weren't standardized yet. So the three are all different, they weigh a little different, so every time you change the lens, you change the camera on the, on the rig, it's like, oh, you have to rebalance it. So, so uh, with that, it, was, uh, it, 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 uh, it just ele elevated the, 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 the the look of, of the film so much from uh, what could have been a, 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 a home video looking like movie to uh, a much more professional looking like film. Would you do it again? No, absolutely not. <laughs> You're not even called. <laughs> but, but you know what, it turned out to be really the right camera for us because we shot a lot on the street as you guys saw and, and uh, she and uh, uh, Darren were able to, to, to get all the permits, all the right permits, so we were, you know, all properly permitted on the street, but we didn't have anybody to lock down the street and ask people not to come and interrupt the scene. So with that, shooting with a couple of phones were a great advantage, because people walk right through and they took a loan, and they walk right through, they didn't care, no, they didn't take us seriously. This is like, some guys with a phone, and, you know, nobody took it seriously. So that's, that's, uh, somebody said. Yeah, Darren just said the biggest footprint was the sound gear. You know, we actually had to sometimes ask Iron Strauss, who is a wonderful sound mixer, to hide his cart behind donut time and to lose the boom, because that was really the only giveaway we were shooting something semi-professional. And he kind of had the hardest job to be, I mean, honestly, like, he, he like was in full. I think he had a nervous breakdown. He's six foot five, and every time we're to have a cab shot, he's in the trunk. Including the car wash, um, he's a trooper. But you know what? He does amazing work. He's an incredible, you know, sound location sound mixer. And I said this in another Q and A, and I'm gonna say it again. He was crying at the donut time. <laughs> it was it was it was rough. But, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, that's the one thing I said. Go. I, I get a lot of uh, questions on like Twitter and Facebook about how we recorded on the iPhone. We didn't. You know, this was a professional sound job, we sunk everything in post, you know, that's important. Uh, it's what separate, bad sound is what really separates you from, you know, not, not professional to professional. The driving seems the most fun for, for, for Iron because he's, uh, you know, he's always, you know, like, 
Tron 36 to tell a tall that is hiding in the trunk. Now actors often forget there's a sound man in the trunk on the track. <laughs> so I remember on uh, on uh, on Starlet, which I hope some of you are staying to watch on the, 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 the next movie, um, there were some driving scenes that um, Stella completely forgot that Ivan was there. She wasn't driving any, you know, she wasn't like, you know, going crazy with the driving, but she just wasn't rem wasn't thinking somebody's in there. So ten minutes later, Ivan came out throwing up, and he was so mad. So just... <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we don't have a ton of time, but I do want to just get a question from the audience. Is there yeah, yeah. anyone with that uh, oh, burning question out there? Sure, yeah, here. Um, it's an incredible movie, Sean. It was the best film at Sundance, and it's just going to be bigger than anything. So all of you should be really proud. But I wanted to ask about cameras. And when you did Prince of Broadway, which was also, in some ways, the rhythm was very similar and intimate, how the iPhone, what the iPhone gave you that you didn't have in that first film. So I'm just going to repeat it. The question is about cameras and what the, what the setup this time gave you or what benefits it had that you didn't have in, in previous films? Yeah, um, well, the, yeah, one of the benefits that the iPhone actually revealed to us while we were actually shooting um, was the fact that we, uh, you know, I like to work with first timers and mix on the seasoned actors, right? So, uh, my, in this case, Maya and Kiki were first timers. And usually, from what I've noticed in the past, it takes about a week for first timers to get comfortable, to get over that hump, to, to, uh, because they usually have a big camera in their face. In this, in this case, you know, Maya and Kiki were comfortable from day one, minute one, where, where I saw that, um, you know, we were using advice that they owned themselves. So between takes, they were whipping out their own cell phones and taking selfies and stuff. So it was something that the intimidation factor was wiped away. And I, I saw that Maya and Kiki had this confidence level that was on the same level as these two guys from the very beginning. So that was a wonderful thing that I really actually didn't see coming until I was there on the first couple of days of shooting. And I think we have time for one more. Yes, right there. Um, I was just curious, did Maya and Kiki have any sort of reservations in terms of uh, playing these sort of <coughs> stereotypical roles of being trans females and falling into sex work did they have any sort of reservations or concerns about that? Or did Actually, so, yeah. sorry, one second. <laughs> so the question was um, whether Maya and Kiki, the main actresses, had any reservations about the roles they were playing. Yeah, actually, yeah, quite the opposite. Uh, they, they are very close friends with, with women who work the area. Um, they, they, you know, they, they basically have witnessed a ton themselves, and they wanted this story to be told. Um, you know, it was funny because, not funny, <laughs> but there was something very interesting that happened very early on, because this, this film definitely leans a little more towards comedy than my other films, and, but there was something that was very important that Maya said to me about, even before I met Kiki. Uh, I had already shown her my other film, she's understood my sensibility, and she, she said to me, you know, I trust you, I want to make this film with you. But you have to promise me two things. And number one, you have to show like the harsh reality of what goes on out here. You know, these women are here because they have to be. You know, I want, uh, okay, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and um, even if it's brutal, even if it's hard to watch, even if it's on PC, I want you to show this. And then she goes, and number two, I want you to make this hilarious. I want you to make this entertaining for us and for the women who are actually working the corner. And, and I, I looked at her and I was like, are you, are you serious? <laughs> no, that's, that's asking. That's a hard. That's gonna be a hard balancing act. And but I went home and I thought about it, and I thought about it over the next few days, and I realized that you know um, she was asking for something that was was actually my approach. I thought was what might have been more of a, a, a plight of type of film going in, and not really using the the, the humor that I saw these women women use themselves to cope every day. And then I realized how right she was, you know, and how, and she was asking for something that was, you know, uh, that would be presenting these characters to like the mainstream audiences in a, in a pop culture way so that they could, you know, identify with them. Because, you know, that's how we reach our mainstream. We reach them through, you know, uh, uh, pop culture. So, so 
Um, I'm really happy she said that to me. It was a very important turning point for, me, for the way that we made this film, I think. Um, and you know, in post-production, uh, I witnessed uh, firsthand uh, how difficult, you know, um, trans women of color, what they have to deal with, especially there in that area, coming from poverty. I could, I watched Maya get turned down from over 60 something jobs. And you know, she knows automobiles, cars, in and out. Like she knows cars like you wouldn't believe. I got her, she was turned down by every car dealership, every garage, they always gave her the run around. And it was something that I just, you know, I, I, I witnessed it. I knew, you know, this is something that's real. You know, the, 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 the oppression, the discrimination that they have to deal with, you know. But, uh, so yes, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. If you want to hear more from Sean, he was really nice and did an interview for our podcast. So go to our website, filmlink.com, listen to that, and subscribe. And Tangerine opens here and elsewhere tomorrow. So please tell all your friends to see this amazing film. Thank you.